Hello and welcome to this topic explainer video. My name is Helen Forster, I'm an advanced tax tutor and in this video I'm going to be looking at the topic of purchase of own shares from the Advanced Tax UK syllabus. What I want to do is to look at how this might be tested in the exam, the kind of scenarios that it might feature in, to give you a bit of an overview and an understanding of the topic and I will look at a couple of examples to help you to understand how things work and I can also point you towards further resources that you might find useful. First of all, how does this area get tested in the advanced tax exam? Well, it's not a subject that is tested in every exam, but we have seen a few questions in recent years. I've just picked out some of the ones here that have been released by the ACCA. We had a section A question in 2022, and then we had a couple of section B questions, one in 2017, one in 2016. However, you do need to remember that not all of the questions from the real exams are released by the ACCA, so it could have featured in more questions. And also, there is no choice in the exam. So if this topic does come up, then it's a good idea for you to have a bit of an understanding of how it works so that you can attempt those questions. And there will be some nice easy marks available for basic computations, even if you're not 100% sure of all of the detailed rules on this area. In terms of a scenario, purchase of own shares is simply where a shareholder sells their shares back to the company that they hold those shares in. Now, this is something that does require legal considerations. Usually a shareholder can't simply choose to sell their shares back to the company, but it is possible in certain situations. And as far as you're concerned, you just need to know the tax treatment when this happens. And I think it's easier to get your head around this if we draw ourselves a diagram and think about the kind of scenario that it might appear in. Let's imagine then that we have a family company. Mum owns most of the shares. Mum has 90% of the shares. Son has 5% and her daughter has 5% as well. It's a successful company. Mum wants to retire and sell her shares, which are now worth a million pounds. Think about the options that we might have here then. Most obviously, Mum could simply sell her shares to an outsider, which is a possibility. However, the problem with that is that she would then lose control, the family would lose control of the family company. Plus, it might be quite hard to find a buyer if this is a small, unquoted company. Another option would be to sell the shares to the son or the daughter or both. Now, remember that if mum wants to retire and all of her wealth is built up in that company, then she will need the money for her retirement. She could just give the shares to the son and the daughter, but that's not going to achieve her objective here. Now, this is a great possibility that would then leave the shares in the hands of the two children. The issue there is mum comes to you and says, will you buy my shares for a million pounds? The chances are the son and the daughter don't have the cash to do that. Nice idea, but unfortunately that's not going to work either. So this is where our purchase of own shares comes in. The other option is that mum could sell her shares back to the company. As I said, there are certain legal procedures that would have to be followed, but this in this type of situation could be an ideal solution. Otherwise known as a purchase of own shares or a share buyback, what will happen is that mum will sell the shares back to the company in exchange for cash. Mum then will have the cash for her retirement. The company will of course be worth less than before, having paid all the cash out to mum but it's still a family company. And if the son and the daughter previously owned equal shareholdings, if mum sells all of the shares back, they will then own 50% each. 
Mum might decide to keep some shares just so that she has a little bit of an influence. The issue that we're going to be concerned with is how do we treat this from a tax point of view? And there are actually two possible tax treatments here. Think about the scenario. Mum has just sold her shares, let's say for a million pounds. And the most obvious tax treatment for mum is that that is going to be a sale of shares, which will lead to capital gains tax. Nice and straightforward. We take the proceeds, less the cost. Think about possible reliefs. We've got the annual exemption maybe, and then the rate of tax is going to depend on whether or not we get business asset disposal relief. And also, if not, the level of mum's income. Now that's one possible tax treatment, but the other way of thinking about this is that this is a payment from a company to a shareholder. Payment from a company to a shareholder, otherwise known as a dividend. And that's the other possible tax treatment. Treat the payment to mum as if that's a dividend, otherwise known as the income treatment. We do have to do a small adjustment because mum has still disposed of her shares, but most of the payment can be treated as a dividend. Now, unfortunately, we can't simply choose between these. The rule is the capital gains tax treatment applies if a set of conditions is satisfied. We'll think about what those are very shortly. The dividend treatment, the income treatment applies if those conditions are not satisfied. So here are the conditions for the capital treatment. This is the bit you need to learn. Now we have some conditions that apply to the company, some that apply to the individual. Very importantly, all of these conditions have to be satisfied. And if they are satisfied, the capital treatment happens automatically. If any of these conditions is not satisfied, then we would have to use the income treatment, the dividend treatment. The company has to be an unquoted trading company and the repurchase must be for the benefit of the trade. Examples of that would be if we had a dispute between shareholders, let's say there's been a fight between some of the shareholders which is affecting the business, or possibly a shareholder retiring, which was our little scenario. Now, one thing that it is possible to do is to make sure that you seek clearance from HMRC first. In real life, if you want to make sure that you get the capital treatment, then you could seek clearance from HMRC to make sure that they agree. For the individual, the individual has to be UK resident. And most importantly, the individual must have owned the shares for at least five years. Now that's reduced to three years if the shares were inherited. And finally, the individual must be reducing their shareholding substantially, which means after the repurchase, slightly tricky because the shares that are sold back to the company will be cancelled. So there will then be fewer shares than there were originally, but of the remaining shares, the shareholder can have no more than 30% and no more than 75% of their previous percentage shareholding. Now those final two points are only going to be relevant if the shareholder wants to keep some shares. In our little scenario, mum was probably going to sell all of her shares back to the company, in which case she would own nothing and her new shareholding would be zero, which of course is well below 75% of what she had before. But if she wanted to keep some of the shares, then we would just need to make sure that we satisfied those if she wanted to have the capital treatment. It is quite easy to breach that rule if you decide that the income treatment is going to be better. But usually, as we'll see when we go through an example, we will find that the capital treatment results in less tax.
Very often in exam questions, what you might have to do is to think about these conditions, or you might just have to consider some of these conditions. So the question could say that some of these have been satisfied and might, let's say, ask you to consider the substantial reduction test. Sometimes there might be missing information. That's where you can apply the professional skill of scepticism by questioning whether, for example, this is a repurchase for the benefit of the trade. So let's run through a quick example now with some numbers then. Here, we have Kai who owns 5,000 of the 20,000 shares in Yam Limited, which is an unquoted trading company. He subscribed for the shares at par. What that means then is that if these are one pound ordinary shares, Kai paid the one pound nominal value. So he will have paid 5,000 pounds for those shares. He wants to retire and will sell his shares back to the company for £45 each. And we need to think about the tax implications. Before we start with the calculations, let's think about those conditions. The company is an unquoted trading company, so that's one of our conditions for the capital treatment. Kai wants to retire, which means that this will probably be for the benefit of the company's trade which is another of our conditions, although we might want to confirm that. We know that Kai has owned his shares since 2015, greater than five years. That's another one of our conditions. And presumably he is going to be selling all of his shares. It just says sell his shares. If that is all, then that would be a substantial reduction. He will have zero shares afterwards. The only condition that we're not sure about, if we look back at those conditions, we've got the unquoted trading company, repurchase for the benefit of the trade. We've got the five years, we've got the substantial reduction. We don't know anything about Kai's residence situation. So that is something that we might need to query. Is Kai UK resident? If he is, then it looks like we're going to get the capital treatment. If not, or if HMRC didn't agree that this was for the benefit of the trade, then it would be the income treatment. I've just drawn a little diagram of the scenario. Kai is selling 5,000 shares back to Yam Limited in exchange for cash of £45 each. He will receive then a total of £225,000. If we use the capital treatment, that will be capital gains tax, and it's going to be a nice, simple, chargeable gain. Proceeds less cost. Proceeds 225. Kai subscribed for his shares at par. That means the cost we said was one pound per share, and that gives him a 220,000 pound gain. How we tax that gain depends on his personal tax situation. The details in this one are slightly vague. So if you're doing one in the exam, you need to look out for things like, has he made any other gains? That will determine whether or not the annual exempt amount is available. Then we need to calculate the tax on that gain. And in this question, we know that Kai has owned the shares since 2015 and has also been a full-time director, which should be a clue to think about business asset disposal relief. This is one of your key capital gains tax reliefs. And for business asset disposal relief on shares, we need a shareholding of at least 5%. Kai had 5,000 shares of the total of 20,000 shares, which is 25%. He has been an employee. He became a full-time director when he subscribed for the shares. He's done both of those things for at least two years since 2015, which means that he will only have to pay capital gains tax at 10%. These are the sorts of things that you might have to refer to in an exam question. They might ask you to explain any reliefs available as well as those conditions for the capital treatment. 
and if you are explaining reliefs available, make sure that you state the conditions for the relief, but also show that you've applied those to the question by referring to the information from the question. If the conditions for the capital treatment are not satisfied, then we're going to use the income treatment. With the income treatment, we're going to treat the proceeds as a dividend. Now we can't treat the whole of the proceeds as a dividend because Kai has actually disposed of his shares. He won't own those anymore. So what we do is we split that figure. The CGT proceeds are deemed to be the original subscription price, which in our case was £5,000. And because Kai was the original subscriber, that's what he paid as well, which means there won't actually be any gain. Sometimes you could end up there with a capital loss if the shareholder purchased their shares for more than the original subscription price, but here we've just got zero gain. And then the balance of the proceeds will be treated as a dividend. That gives us £220,000 dividend, and that's going to be subject to income tax at the dividend rates. We could have the dividend nil rate band, depending on whether or not Kai has any other dividends, and then the rate of tax will depend on other income, but with an amount of 220,000, at least part of that is going to be at the additional rate of tax for dividends, some at the higher rate for dividends if Kai hasn't already used the higher rate band. Which means that compared to the tax on the gain, there is going to be significantly more tax due here. Capital gains tax is going to be at 10% because Kai will qualify for business asset disposal relief. Which means that we can fairly safely say that the capital treatment is better. Let's think about a slight variation on that example then. Same scenario to start with that we've just looked at, but this time the question is, what is the minimum number of shares that Kai must sell back to Yam Limited if he wants to use the capital treatment? Going back to our conditions, remember that we need a substantial reduction. After the repurchase, the shareholder can have no more than 30% of the remaining shares and no more than 75% of the previous percentage share. And this is not quite as straightforward as it seems because the shares that are repurchased will be cancelled. So I want to show you how you can easily work this out. Kai currently has 5,000 shares. There are a total of 20,000 shares in that company. And we want to find the minimum to get the capital gains tax treatment. The condition is that Kai must end up with no more than 30% of the total shares after the buyback, remembering that the ones that Kai sells will be cancelled, and also no more than 75% of his previous percentage share. And again, that will be based on the shares after the buyback. Now we know that currently Kai has 5,000 shares from 20,000, which is 25%. 75% of his previous percentage share means that he must have no more than 18.75%. One of these two conditions is going to be our limiting factor. And in this case, it is that 75% test. After the buyback, he can't have more than 30%, but also he can't have more than 18.75%. Now, 18.75% is obviously the lower figure, so we need to take Kai's percentage down to exactly 18.75%. The easiest way to do this is to remember that we have some other shareholders. And the other shareholders, if Kai owns 5,000 of the 20,000 shares, must own 15,000. Their shares, the number of shares, is not going to change. What will change is the percentage. 
The other shareholders after the buyback will still have 15,000 in terms of a number of shares. But if we want Kai to have 18.75%, that means that the other shareholders, 15,000 shares, must represent the remaining 81.25%. So afterwards, the 15,000 shares held by the others will represent 81.25%. We're trying to find how many shares Kai can hold afterwards, and that needs to be 18.75%. Bit of maths. 15,000 divided by 81.25 times by 18.75, round that down, means that Kai can have 3,461 shares. And we'll have a new total shareholding of 18,461. Just check to see that that works. 3461 as a percentage of 18,461 is 18.75%. Kai currently has 5,000 shares. And therefore our solution is that Kai needs to sell a minimum of 1,539 shares of his 5,000 to get the capital gains tax treatment. If he sells more than that, that's fine. If he sells less than that, all that will happen is that we will use the income treatment. We'll treat that as a dividend, which might mean that he pays more tax, although in some situations could mean a lower tax bill. If he's still got his dividend nil rate band and if the amount fell into the basic rate income tax band, then that could actually be beneficial. So it will depend on the scenario. That was a quick overview of purchase of owned shares. For further resources, have a look at the ACCA's study hub where you'll find lots of notes, quizzes, there are flashcards and also some practice questions. Company purchase of owned shares is covered in chapter 20 of the study notes where you'll find more detail and some examples. There's also a quiz on that chapter which has some questions as well. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful and I wish you the best of luck with your ongoing studies.